How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. Hello, top tier YouTube subscribers. I just resubscribed to my own Twitch. Yes, I have to pay for my own Twitch. That's the way life goes. We got a lot to get into today. It's Wednesday here in this program. And yeah, you know what that means? Tonight, AEW Dynamite. We got a big show coming up tonight, St. Patrick's Day. We got Britt Baker, Thunder Rose in a cage match. Hangman Page and Jurassic Express versus Adam Cole and Red Dragon. Scorpio Sky versus Wardlow. Brian Danielson, John Moxley versus Chuck Taylor and Wheeler Yuta. The Hardys will be facing Private Party. Jericho Appreciation Society commencement. And more. Titles on the line in the Britt Baker match as well as the Scorpio Sky match. Angles will be happening the whole nine yards. Should be a lot of fun, so we'll talk about that. As well as Jay Briscoe apologizing for a quite famous tweet now from uh, many, many years ago that have, in fact, kept the Briscoes out of WWE and AEW. We'll tell you about that. William Regal appeared on Talk as Jericho and uh, went into a lot of detail about uh, that interview he did last week where he had that line about how he wasn't long for this world and it was all kind of worrisome. He does claim he's good now, but he was not good. And it's pretty much pretty much a miracle that he's alive. We can tell you about that. The whole interview is on Talk is Jericho. We got updates on Joey Janela, WWE versus MLW. As Dave noted on Twitter, WWE provided evidence that they were not a monopoly, and it was an issue of an observer that noted when AEW and WWE went head-to-head, AEW won. Remember when people on the internet said, that doesn't really count. Well, WWE thought it counted enough to put it in a lawsuit to defend themselves against claims that they are a monopoly. Anyway, lots to get into back in a moment, Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Elber is here, Wrestling Observer Alive. Hey, there I am, Mike Sempervivi here. Also of WrestlingObserver.com, CM Punk morphed into me instantly. Look at he split. Oh, we have so much to talk about here today. And yes, we missed the Raw report yesterday, so fear not. I got Raw and NXT today. And bro, I don't want to hear one person telling me not to do this NXT 2.0 report. How in God's name could you not want to talk about these these segments with with uh, Cora Jade and and uh, Toxic Attraction? God, I could talk for years. <laughs> Everyone who's saying UG right now, they didn't watch the show. Because if they did, they would be salivating at the ability to talk about these these segments. In a now deleted podcast, Jay Briscoe again apologized for past homophobic tweets that have reportedly prevented he and his brother Mark from being hired in either WWE and AEW. Fightful first had the transcription of the interview on the Battlegrounds podcast. But the episode was taken down shortly thereafter. Battlegrounds has yet to respond to an inquiry as to why. Fife reported last week a person of influence within Warner Media did not want the reigning Ring of Honor tag team champion signed to AEW because of Jay's 2013 tweets. When asked about the report, Jay didn't specifically address whether AEW had shown interest, but did again apologize for his actions in 2013, saying he thought he, quote, was taking a stand for the Lord back in the day. I put out a stupid tweet nine years ago. The most dumbest, immature, obnoxious, I can't say the word, I've ever done. I don't want anybody from any walk of life to feel like they can't care for the Briscoes because I promise we love everybody. We love everybody and we just want to go out there and be pro wrestlers and give the best match that we can. I said some dumb stuff a long time ago. I apologize for it. I'll apologize for it again. It was stupid. I feel like now there are people who look at us. We can't cheer for them because they hate a certain group of people. We don't hate nobody. We love everybody. We're just some country boys. He then said the comments were from immaturity. They were counterproductive to what God wants, which is to be a human being and relate to others with love. Jay said, quote, we're not like that when it comes to fans label it, labeling them a certain way. So uh, we'll see if this leads to anything. Obviously, this did lead to uh, WWE not bringing in the Briscoes. And uh, as noted, I had been told months ago, actually, from uh, and this is from people that actually 
They are they are big fans of the Briscoes, but they just said it's too bad about those tweets. This was months ago. So this is not a new thing that uh, the reason that the Briscoes have not been on AEW television was because of these tweets. But we shall see if uh, well, this apology leads or does not lead to. So there you go. Yeah, it, <laughs> I wonder why they took down the podcast. I wonder what the reason is exactly behind that, that they pulled the whole thing down altogether for whatever reason. I, you know, there's no defense of what Jay said and what he tweeted nine years ago. That's for sure. You know, I know him a little bit, a little tiny bit, and they're Western Sussex County, you know, the farm boys who never went off the peninsula, <laughs> you know, but uh, I, I – Hopefully, hopefully they have learned from it. And I think that they have, you know, Effie talked about it on his podcast when he and AJ Gray went in there to face the Briscoes after the Briscoes came into GCW and win the tag titles. And Jay, you know, said the same thing to Effie as he has to a lot of people about how apologizing about how dumb it was, basically saying the same thing for all intents and purposes that he said on this podcast. It was dumb. We were dumb, just some dumb country boys and screwed up. And they're going to, because they said it, because it was tweeted, because Jay tweeted it, uh, they're just going to have to ride with the consequences of this for a long long time but uh you know it's too bad uh in some ways you know obviously from a wrestling point of view talent wise but it all comes down to what you believe about how they feel and how you feel about their apology new aw roster member william regal opened up on jericho's podcast regarding serious health issues he has had to deal with including being told he had 24 hours to live in early 2019 I was in a hospital for eight weeks, he said. I was given at one point 24 hours to live. I had sepsis in my leg. They were going to cut my leg off January 4, 2019, he said. Since 1998, I've had pericarditis, an inflammation of the sac around your heart. And what it does is scar the sac, so your heart can beat, but the sac can sort of lock down. He detailed a serious neck injury he believes he suffered in 1993 during a match with Ricky Steamboat. Injury went up. Uh, untreated for many years eventually required multiple surgeries including one to fuse four discs wow in his neck together he hasn't training as much which led to further heart issues he said i wasn't training i wasn't wrestling i'd slow down the sacra in my heart locked down scarring locked down it started to calcify inward slowly and slowly i was having more and more things such as my heart going out of rhythm my legs swelling up it was just building up going to doctor to doctor all of these different things uh, 2018 started. First few months, I was having all sorts of swelling in my legs. I go on a scouting trip to Costa Rica, get off the plane. I'm feeling dizzy. Not so bad. Just so anybody knows, no drinking, no anything. This is all things with my heart. He fell forward down an escalator, shattering his left eye socket. Had three oh. weeks of amnesia after that. No idea what happened. I was in a hospital for a week in Costa Rica, had shattered my eye socket, three weeks amnesia, lost 40% of my vision in my left eye, six weeks of treatment was getting better, but the legs kept swelling, was having trouble walking. Finally, there's a cardiologist in the room, this lady saved my life. She goes, hang on a second, there's something about that that doesn't look right. They scanned an area in his abdomen, further scans were ordered, called from the uh, cardiologist saying the sac had completely calcified. If they did not remove the calcified area, he had less than six months to live. Got a doctor in Atlanta to do it. Eight weeks in the hospital after surgery. Keep in mind he was uh, in charge of NXT during all of this time. So remember every now and then you wouldn't see him for a while? Well, now you know where he was at. Then he's in the hospital. Uh, he was got He got into the ambulance after he fell out of bed New Year's Day. Uh, sepsis in his leg. Doctor called the wife, told her if they didn't cut off his leg, he had 24 hours left to live. I don't know if you've noticed, but he didn't get his leg cut off. Uh, they in, he was injected with this, 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 he said. That's what the doctor told him. And uh, somehow, because they weren't going to do it, they worked and they saved his leg. Two days before the NXT UK show from Blackpool, where Walter uh, debuted, he's in the hospital. Something in his brain went click, and he just thought, I'm going to be okay. And within a very quick time, he was walking three miles a day. Within two months, he was doing 500 squats again. If you want to hear the whole thing, you can listen to uh, to Jericho's podcast because he talks about a lot of other stuff in addition to that. Wow. And uh, there you go. 
what can, what what do you say about that? It's just absolutely unbelievable resilience from from Regal and his his DNA and his internal drive. Just wow! Uh, when your body turns on you like that, you know. And he's not an old man, but in wrestling years, you know, a lot of a lot of tread came off that tire, you know. Uh, it's just it's amazing. It's amazing what he's gone through, and it's amazing that he's still here and. Just an incredible. I got it now. I'm definitely going to listen to that. I was going to listen to it anyway. Uh, but just just over his medical issues alone, I mean, that is extreme. And then you think about, and again, I don't know what WWE pays for and what he didn't, you know, with his, his status there. It but paid can you for imagine? everything. Good. Can you, cause you, can you imagine being in a foreign country suffering like that? And I know Costa Rica, Belize are very, you know, uh, are, there's a lot of money there. So if you travel, you know, you, you can make out okay, but still you're in a foreign country and you have this stuff happen to you. You're fine. It just, all of these things, it's just, it, it's amazing. Absolutely amazing that he's alive and around and, and now, you know, in AEW going to give back in the same way he was in WWE for such a long time. And I could see if he was salty by the end, as everybody talks about Brian about him being a little bit, you know, tough to deal with and a little bit salty at the end. After going through all that stuff and after seeing what happened with NXT, boy, I tell you what, I'd, I'd say he probably had a right to be pretty salty. It's a real man's man right there. You're damn right. Someone came up with that idea for the new group. The real man's men. Love it. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Elber is here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. Here we go! WWE has filed a motion to dismiss an antitrust lawsuit from MLW. MLW filed suit against WWE in January, alleging they put pressure on third parties to abandon relationships with them. The suit specifically mentions a deal with the Fox-owned streaming service 2 TV. As MLW's lawsuit says a deal with them fell apart after WWE interfered. WWE's motion to dismiss reads, MLW's claim for intentional interference with prospective economic advantage fails because MLW does not allege that WWE knew about MLW's negotiations to sell a third-party first-run programming. WWE has been wrongfully... Uh, well, hold on here. WWE, uh, the lawsuit claims in early 2021, a WWE executive contacted Vice TV and put pressure on them to stop working with MLW. Uh, Vice did air one MLW special on October 7, featuring Alexander Hammerstone def uh, defeating Jacob Fatu to win the MLW heavyweight title. Court Bauer said WWE has been wrongfully depriving its competitors of critical opportunities for many years. Its latest conduct has been even more unconscionable. I think we speak for the rest of the professional wrestling world when we say that this anti-competitive behavior has to stop. WWE lawyer Jerry McDivitt was quoted in The Observer regarding the lawsuit. He said, quote, If Tubi breached, then sued Tubi. As to Vice, WWE has no commercial relationship with them, or for that matter, any of the other dozens of content distribution entities with whom MLW could do a deal if they had a commercially viable product. They put a show on Vice, if my memory serves me correctly, after one of the Dark Side shows, and lost most of the audience. I think I read they got 40,000 viewers. No wonder Vice did no further deal. <laughs> It's Jerry McDivitt. I love the petty. Oh, my God. That's lawyer petty right there. Because, you know, Jerry McDivitt isn't just, like, you know, hanging out with, like, knowledge of vice ratings just at his side. But there he is right there. Like, oh, I recall it happened to come on after an episode of Dark Side of the Ring. I believe they lost all of the viewers. I think it was 40,000, maybe. I love it. I just, it, it, this kills me. This whole suit. I have no dog in this fight. I don't care. It is interesting. Where is the lawsuit for Time Warner and uh, whoever it is that owns Vice? Where is the lawsuit for Tubi? I, I don't. On paper, I don't see what court is uh, is going to battle here. But that's I'm not a lawyer either, so they figure they have something there. But they're going up against a monster who will use anything at his disposal, including the words of Dave Meltzer. Which uh, they usually always say, you know, his his news is Dave Baker tweets doesn't here. Exist I don't whatever. know if you saw it on my timeline. No. In the WWE's response to the MLW lawsuit, besides the written response, they provided 
An exhibit. The exhibit. Exhibit A? Was the October 18, 2021 issue of The Observer that covered WWE losing the 30 minutes head-to-head with AEW as evidence that they were not a dominant monopoly. They're not a monopoly. So as I noted, MLW luckily has thousands of fans on my timeline who can take the stand and say, that didn't count. Uh Nuh-uh. That's what they'd be saying. It's not a monopoly. It's not a monopoly because on October 18, 2021, we lost 30 minutes head-to-head with AEW in 18 to 49. But it's not a monopoly. They're not a monopoly. They are dominant. They may use barbaric corporate practices. They may use aggressive and maybe even underhanded business techniques. We will find that out. But they're actually not a monopoly. They're not. And AEW actually showed that. You want to say that the business world is a monopoly for rich people and only those of the tippy top to be able to buy influence and to make enough friends and have people that work at networks that will listen to your ideas? You want to say it's a monopoly for the rich, for the wealthy, for the for those people, for a different class? Sure. But actually, the wrestling world is not a monopoly. And AEW has proven that. The fact that impact well, let's exists read more. in this world. Let's read more, Mike. Sure. This is gonna. I, I hesitate to even read this. All right. AEW success further undercuts MLW's unsupported assertion that substantial barriers to entry exist. This is from this is from WWE yeah. nerds. It goes on to write: <laughs> the complaint alleges that WWE's popularity has quote declined over the last five years it goes on to say that during the same period aew entered the proposed market and successfully sold broadcast rights to warner media subsequently aw managed to capture an average 2020 rating of 0.344 compared to wwe raw's 0.5075 in the key 18 to 49 demographic this oh, successful matters? entry in expansion refutes the existence of substantial barriers to entry. Oh, there's barriers to entry. You know, I had a guy the other day it's on my money. timeline that was talking about how the key, he actually wrote, the key 18 to 49 demo <laughs> is not all that important. He actually, oh, yeah? he actually said the words key while saying it was not that important Dummy. while while putting a a uh, a picture of the actual uh top 50 cable rankings which are in fact ranked by 18 to 49 oh that was a fun day oh man as somebody that studied pay-per-view buy rates for a long time so i had to go into a lot of old broadcasting cables and old kagan surveys and all that sort of stuff from back in the day the 18 to 49 demo absolutely positively has always 100% mattered at all times everywhere and has always been a part of them marketing that show, selling it to broadcasters, Nash, all those sorts of things. It has always mattered and it probably always will. Mm, he might be on the uh, chat here. He said key demos to mock you, Brian. To mock me? It is the key demo. <laughs> so, yeah, what, He's what's mocking the... himself by acting yeah. stupid. That's like mocking anyway, the fact that, like, you know, drug manufacturers spend a lot of money on those news shows where it's like people who are 60 and over. There's a reason they do that. That's their target. Since when is 18 to 34 not a target for everything? Get the hell out of here. Stop it. Combination Stop of it. NBA and daylight savings time changed, as always. Daylight savings time changed the usual viewing patterns for Raw. 1.70 million viewers, 0.48. In the key 18 to 49 demo, Raw was second behind the Denver Nuggets versus Philadelphia 776ers NBA game. 1.62 million viewers and a point five three in 18 to 49. Barely ahead of the late game with the Milwaukee Bucks versus Utah Jazz. Average 1.4 million. Tucker Carlson against the first hour of Raw. That sounds like an NXT name. Did 3.95 million viewers. They actually had a Tucker, now that I think about it. <laughs> your gimmick, though. And a point three eight. Raw was in 16th place for the night. The hours, 1.67 million viewers. We're back to 9 p.m., 1.75 million. Hour 2 is now the most watched hour. And then it fell to 1.68 million viewers for the third hour. So there you go. But you know what, everyone? It was number two on cable. 
USA's happy. I'm sure that they are happy. Second hour, the big hour. <laughs> One week of that, I guess, until everybody gets acclimated. It always kills me. Daylight savings time throws such a wrench into everybody. Uh, when it comes to their TV viewing the next day at night, it's just amazing. You how stay that out matters, longer. But... It's not dark at 430 when you pick your kid up from school anymore. Yeah, you guys, you guys that live further south don't have to experience that. I walk to pick my kid up at school. It's dark. I walk her home in the dark. What is I being hate in daylight the south savings have to time. Do with that, what is? Why would being in the south? Because have the further to do the further that? south you go, it, it gets dark a little bit later. Whereas the further north you go, you know nothing about Alaska. Well, what are you? What are you in? Like, if you're a marathon at the bottom of the Florida Keys, you're telling me it's like you know two hours later they get like that much extra. Come on! Don't even tell me. You're I have exaggerating. To ex- this. Don't even tell me. I have to explain the sun. And Brother, I live at the beach. I watch it come up every morning, and I know how this really? whole thing you ever, works. You're you ever acting been... as if that they're, you're adding like an hour onto those people's day that they're getting, and you're not getting because you're all the way up north, and you have to travel to go get your kids uphill five miles in the snow, no matter what Mike, type of season don't it die is. on this hill, you idiot. You go a little further south, and it's actually like dark for 18 hours all day because you're further north, dude. The further south you go, the, the lighter it's going to be. The later further in the day. north I am? Did you just say that? If I go... <laughs> where is there an 18-hour day in the States at this time of year? Is that also where the Aurora Borealis is right now? Can I take a look at that, too? Oh, this guy. Yep. I I agree with Brian. I lived in Boston. It was dark at 3.30 in January. Mm, how about that? Yeah. <laughs> Mike, Mike, you're wrong. <laughs> what are you doing? How what did are we you get talking here? about? Jeez, simp. <laughs> the further at three thirty, <laughs> I'm expli- I am explaining because it's to cloudy a grown and you man. live in Boston in the winter. That's why it's like Holy that at three thirty. You geek. Can we go to the can sun? We go still to... goes down at four forty-five or five, whatever it is. You big nerd. Mike doesn't like science confirmed. I could have told you that. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Mike, go back to high school science. This person says. <laughs> Oh, man. Oh, my God. It still doesn't have any. You have no proof that the people, that, what is the time? How much Mike, more do they get than you? I lived in New Brunswick. You it was getting dark by 3.30 in the deep parts of New winter. Brunswick. Yeah. Come you know, on. Because it's north. That's exactly what I said, and you ridiculed me. Oh, you live in Washington State. You're trying to act like people in the, in the continental United States have it so much better than you well, because their they, day is so much longer It, it is longer. Time. It is longer. Uh, That's the point, you geek. Had that problem. And the your old further life. north you go, it's yeah. shorter. It's oh I've my lord! Thank God we're doing the raw and NXT report after the break because it can't be worse than that. Back in a moment, Observer Live. These people oh, out. Oh, get out of here, Mike! I'm about Don't to make cuss me these people out. Oh man! Mm-mm-mm. Let me talk about these shows because we missed the the uh, raw report yesterday, which now is so far away I've forgotten about it. But luckily. Anyway, so Raw opened up with Kevin Owens coming out, and he cuts his promo on Steve Austin, dropped a hey yo in there, and uh, promised to beat up uh, Steve Austin at WrestleMania, and then gave a stunner to a cameraman who took a great bump. Great bump. Too bad this guy wasn't in shape, because I'd have hired him. Then we had uh, Damian Priest versus Finn Balor. This was a non-title match, and they went seven minutes, and then uh, uh, Finn Balor hit him with the reckoning after Balor was distracted by Austin Theory, who, by the way, they're not even on the same show nor feuding with each other, but we needed some sort of interference here. So uh, then Austin Theory gave Balor his finish, and uh, presumably, I mean, I shouldn't say anything, so I just won't. But anyway, he laid the guy out. We had uh, Kevin Patrick talking to Seth Rollins, talking about how you have no path to WrestleMania. And the fans in the background began loudly chanting for Cody, which they did not silence. They let it play. We had the long-awaited Battle of the Giants, Omos, and Commander Aziz. And uh, some people think I just hate Raw and I'm unfair. I'm a fair man. This match was so much better than it had any right to be. I was expecting this to be the bottom of the barrel, absolute trash, and it was totally fine. It was only two minutes, and they didn't do anything. But it was so much better than I expected. Omos pinned him with a tree slam. 
and then choke slammed Apollo Crews afterwards. It was fine two minutes of television. Then we had the ongoing storyline where Rollins is going up to Owens and he comes up with this idea to get on WrestleMania. I'm going to do my own talk show. And in fact, I'm going to interview Steve Austin. And Kevin Owens is like, what are you talking about, bro? That's my idea. You're trying to steal my spot. And so uh, long story short, uh, they do a segment later and uh, Sonya Deville puts the match together for the main event. Liv Morgan beat Queen Zelina when uh, Carmella just is flirting, and she actually, no, first she was uh, getting chased, and she jumped into Corey Graves' lap, and then Corey and Carmella are kicking it, Rhea Ripley, and of course, uh, Zelina's uh, distracted and pinned by Liv Morgan in three minutes. And uh, that, uh, man, I can't wait to see this match. We have two nothing happening tag champs that now can't even get along and work together. Anyway, whatever. So it's going to be a multi-team match at the uh, at WrestleMania, which for all I know, Zelina and Liv or Zelina and uh, uh, Carmella are just going to win. But honestly, it should be Rhea Ripley and uh, and Liv Morgan. Yes, but Brian, uh, what about uh, you know Sasha Banks? She's a huge star. She's teaming with Naomi. Uh, they're going to go for the titles at WrestleMania. They are. And they should be screwed by Bailey coming back. That's my booking. And we had a Seth Rollins segment, which is noted, set up the match for the main event. Ray and Dominic defeated Shelton Benjamin and Cedric Alexander. At least they actually beat the Hurt Business this week. It was Dominic pinning Cedric with the frog splash. And then they were attacked and beat down by the Miz and Logan Paul. But these damn heel Mysterios, they send Miz outside, and they're going to double-team Logan Paul, these two baby faces. But he manages to escape just in time. Sets up the uh, WrestleMania match. We had an Edge segment. Bro, this guy was so much better as a baby face. Dude. You'll never guess what he said in his heel promo. Should I do a prediction segment? What did Edge say in his heel promo if he didn't watch Raw? Well, if your answer is, it's the fans. It's all your fault, fans. Yes, he blamed the fans and cut a promo saying you would beat AJ at WrestleMania. If I never heard a guy blame the fans again, if I never heard it again, it would be too soon. Proper usage of that phrase. Bianca Belair beat Dewdrop. The match was good. Bro, they always have good matches. I really like the matches. This is the third time I've seen this match in five weeks. Bro, hire some women. Bring up uh, uh, daddy's girl. Something. Don't push it yet. God, the same matches over and over again. Even ones I like. I can only watch the same match so many times before I don't care anymore. Guys, no, nothing. I'm not going to use the term. Then, RK Bro had their championship celebration. This was when the show totally turned around. This was awesome. So they're out there, and they're celebrating, and Randy Orton's arranged this celebration. But it's Randy Orton. He had to put any thought into this. He's got a couple of balloons that are deflated, a couple of a little bit of popcorn. But, man, Matt Riddle's the biggest fan of Randy Orton, so he's never been so happy. It's the greatest day of his life that Randy, they should put Randy and Daddy's girl together. That's a team for you. But he's so happy that Randy has, has thrown this party for him, and the Street Profits show up, and they won a championship match. They actually, of all things, they go, we beat you in a non-title match a few weeks ago. We deserve a championship match. Randy's like, bro, you ain't get a championship match. We had to win a spelling bee to get a shot at these titles. You ain't just getting a shot for winning a match. Ridiculous. Silly. And then Riddle's like, well, bro, we have to have a match. Like, we're all excited to go to WrestleMania. We don't have an opponent. So I think that we should give them a championship match. And so finally, Orton's like, fine, we'll give you a shot at WrestleMania. And then, as they're leaving, Montez Ford has the audacity to say that this party is ass. <laughs> it's a two-pack of ass. Look at that. That's what he said. <laughs> and now now Riddle's furious. And listen, I'm not doing this segment justice. It was, it was 10,000 times better than I'm explaining it. So, so Riddle, now he wants a fight. So it's Riddle versus Montez Ford. And they go nine minutes, and uh, 
just a lame DQ when Alpha Academy runs in, beats everybody up. So it looks like we're going to have... You know how many... For some reason, Seth Rollins can't get a match at Mania, but, like, everybody else can get a match at WrestleMania. There's 50,000 people doing multi-person matches on this show. We had a Scott Hall video package, which was great. And then, as noted, the main event was Kevin Owens and Seth Rollins. They had a very good match. They would went 16 minutes. Uh, Seth had the win, but no ref. And then, uh, finally, uh, Kevin Owens boots him, hits him with a stunner, pins him, Seth Rollins... Still no path to WrestleMania. You guys honestly watched this show and thought Cody ain't coming in. Really? What are you, new? Mm-mm-mm. God. Then we had NXT. Where also there are people without a path Yeah, Cameron to Grimes has no weekend. path to WrestleMania. Maybe Cody's going to NXT. I hadn't thought of that. We had a Scott Hall tribute. Then we had oh uh, the Cody, the Cody NXT post show pizza party. I'm sure would be epic. Oh, bro, that'd be awesome. I I I'd do that. So Miz TV with Dolph Ziggler and bro. When I heard we we're gonna have Miz TV on NXT, I was like, God, I know you want people from the main roster, but I gotta watch this stupid thing on two shows. Thankfully, it was short and quick. They went out there. They had a quick segment. It was interrupted by L.A. Knight. L.A. Knight wants a shot at the title. Ziggler said, all right, it's it's on for the main event here tonight. So that was fine. Then we had a show-long storyline with Cora Jade. Remember how the story was that she was a loser, then she was a geek, and then she was also weak? Remember that? Uh, yeah. Now she's a thief. She well. is She is stolen the NXT women's title, and the NXT women's tag team titles. Theft! She stole them. And she's she's smirking about it. Well, Brian, do you remember the deal she did with Raquel where they did the whole, like, they were, like, flying from tree to tree and all that stuff? Maybe she's just, like, one of those adrenaline junkies who needs to, like, you know, commit, like, petty crimes to, like, get off or something. We well, don't know what the development she, of this character could she be. She has stolen these belts. She's a thief. And the whole show, the whole show, Toxic Attraction wants to find their belts, okay? So the heels have been wronged. They have been robbed, and they're going to try and find their belts. So, you know, one of them, uh, one of the, you know, I forget their name, JC, like she, you know, she sees one of the belts, and I swear to God, she sees the belt hanging from something, and she sneaks up and she goes, Oh! Oh, it didn't jump in me. I'm going to try and grab it. And she grabs it, and then, a, you know, the Rancor's door slams or whatever. And now she's <laughs> trapped. And then uh, the other one. Bro, the best part about it, too, though, is. She's Hold on, you're ruining my flow. Gate, but she's blocked behind the gate, but there's a cameraman suddenly behind her. Yeah. Filming from behind her. So then uh, the other one finds it in a dumpster, but, like, the dumpster closes on her, and then a forklift <laughs> comes down. So they're both trapped. Okay. Wiley kind of style. Then, not only, not only is Cora Jade stolen these championship belts, but she goes to steal Mandy Rose's Escalade. She's going to steal her car. Well, she gets in the car and she looks in the rear view and Mandy's in the car. Of course she is. And she starts beating up Cora and we're supposed to like feel sorry for this thief who tried to steal an Escalade. And then Mandy just beats the absolute living hell out of her and leaves her for dead. (laughs) Like, uh, you know, some some horrible, it just she's dead on the concrete. And then somehow the other two have escaped. And then they're all there so they can pose. Yeah, wait. And what did she spray paint on her back? I thought it was going to be like a yellow streak. It was just no, like she, she but just some put, logo. She just put paint on her. Oh, my God. This was beyond. There was no Emmy getting one for this. I'll tell you that much. I see a... <laughs> How, what, what, how did you feel about the thespianism or whatnot? There was no thespianism in this whatsoever. That is a, that is a profound disrespect to thespians everywhere. Now, uh, even let me continue. Theater. We had Santos Escobar beating Cameron Grimes. This was actually a really good match. Of course and it was. Santos beat him clean in the middle, pinned him. A lot of heel clean wins on this show. Just pinned him clean in the middle of the ring. So Escobar's in the ladder match, and uh, Cameron Grimes has no path to WrestleMania. They found a kid, and he beat Kushida. And so this kid now is going to face, uh, uh, I think, Trick Williams next week. And the winner gets into the ladder match. Match was good, but, bro, I've said it a million times, 
These guys could have a match in every other promotion on the face of this planet. Including up in New Brunswick on a very short day. Oh, for heaven's sake! And it would sakes. be better than this match. Gets the Grayson Waller winner, by the way. Then we had a segment. I was so excited, I almost peed straight up in the air, <laughs> quite frankly. They almost set up Santos Escobar and Rey Mysterio. Oh, man. Instead, it's Dominic Mysterio against Raul Mendoza. No disrespect to either of them, but oh, bro... No. I want to see Rey Mysterio and Santos Escobar. Me too. We had Tiffany Stratton versus Sarai, which was the biggest load of trash I ever saw. So Sarai's gimmick is she wears a schoolgirl outfit backstage, but she goes through the magic smoke in her entrance wearing her medallion, and she transforms into a worker. Well, Tiffany attacks her backstage and tears off the medallion, so now, and this was their exact words, she's unable to do her transformation. Yes, she beat her ass through the entrance. She rolled her out there, and apparently if you get rolled out there by somebody else, you don't transform. So she's thrown out there, she gets beaten up, and uh, Tiffany Stratton does a spinning Vader splash right to the legs of Sarai. I think she broke both her legs. It's payback for Sarai some of those kicks. (laughs) We had a Ciampa promo thanking the fans. It looks like he's on his way out after standing the liver. His last match will be against Tony D'Angelo, it appears. Indy Hartwell, Persia Parada. I mean, it wasn't that bad, but if you've ever seen a match that was practiced 300 times and they just went out and did what they practiced and there was like no emotion or nothing, this was it. We had the return of the creep from the creep farm. A lot of making out afterwards. Damn it, there's the music. Thought I'd do it, but I didn't. Last two matches after the break, Observer Live. I couldn't get it all in before the break. But anyway, Dominic Mysterio beat Raul Men- uh, Mendoza. It was actually a good match. It was. Yeah, Dominic Mysterio's better than people give him credit for because he's on Raw and all that. But Dude, uh, Mendoza's so good. Well, he they, is. Those two guys don't get any credit. Then we had uh, the end of the Cora Jade thing. <laughs> And uh, we had a segment with the Creed Brothers, MSK, and Imperium. Dude, I don't like to bury the fans, but I hate these nerds that just have to boo MSK. And they ruin all the segments. And it's like a small pocket of fans that got mad at them. And it's on national television in this little building. And it's like, whatever. Whatever. And then we had Dolph Ziggler versus LA Knight, which uh, is a good match. It's Dolph Ziggler and LA Knight. And uh, they worked well together. And then same thing. Uh, there was actually interference, but it didn't lead to the finish at all. It was like 10 minutes before the finish. And then finally, uh, L.A. Knight just goes for a charge, misses, gets super kicked, pinned clean in the middle of the ring. Now we got to give Ziggler a little credibility yeah, after he won the title. Of course. And then Braun Breaker hits the ring, and he's he's not smiling raw Braun Breaker today. He's, uh, he's Scott Steiner. Not Rick. He's Scott. And he wants a match at uh, Stand and Deliver, and Ziggler holds up the belt, accepts. So, uh, you know, there was good stuff on this show. But I can't help but notice that every time there's something good, it involves professional wrestlers who have doing professional wrestling for a long time. How about that? And all of their volleyball and fitness and just sucks. But oh well. We just got to keep trying, right? We just got to yeah. keep doing those NILs. Let's keep doing those tryouts with no wrestlers allowed. <laughs> we can only make this thing worse. Thanks, Mike, as always. Callers and listeners up at the studio. We'll talk to you next time. Wrestling Observer Live.